Here's Leon Gary Plochet. He's just shot his young son's abuser live on TV in front of millions of viewers. Some parents will do anything when it comes to their children. Today, we look at six cases of parents who took horrible revenge on their children's abuser. Gary Plochet. In the quiet city of Baton Rouge, Louisiana, Gary Plochet's life was upended in 1984, marking the beginning of a harrowing ordeal that would capture the nation's attention. His son, Jody, just 11 years old, was abducted by someone they trusted. His karate instructor, Jeff Doucet. Jeff not only abducted Jody though, but also subjected him to repeated sexual abuse. This betrayal was beyond comprehension, as Doucet, who had ingratiated himself with the Plochet family, exploited this trust in the most heinous way possible. The ordeal lasted for weeks, leaving the Plochet family in a state of despair and anxiety. The law enforcement finally located Doucet and Jody in a motel in California. Doucet was a arrested and Jody was brought back home, but the trauma of the event lingered. The case took a dramatic turn on March 16, 1984. As Doucet was being escorted through Baton Rouge Metropolitan Airport, Gary Plochet was waiting, armed with a gun. In a moment that was captured on live television, Plochet shot Doucet at point-blank range, killing him instantly. This act carried out in front of police officers and onlookers was a raw and public display of rage and pain. Plochet was arrested and charged with second-degree murder. During the trial, details of Jody's abuse came to light, painting a harrowing picture of what the young boy had endured. The emotional toll on the Plochet family was evident. In a surprising turn of events, Plochet received a seven-year suspended sentence with five years of probation and 300 hours of community service. This lenient sentence reflected the judge's and the community's understanding of the extraordinary circumstances that led to his actions. Gary Plochet passed away on October 20, 2014, but his story continues to resonate. Jesus Mora Flores In the quiet expanse of Lavaca County, Texas, a story unfolded that gripped the nation with its raw intensity and moral complexity. On a seemingly ordinary day, a 23-year-old father's world was shattered when he heard his five-year-old daughter's screams emanating from a remote shed on their family ranch. Rushing to the scene, he was confronted with a horrifying sight. Jesus Mora Flores, a 47-year-old farmhand, was sexually assaulting his young daughter. Driven by a primal urge to protect his child, the father reacted with immediate and brutal force. He beat Flores, a man nearly twice his age, into unconsciousness. Despite the violence of his response, the father's humanity surfaced in the aftermath. Realizing the severity of Flores' injuries, he called 911 in a frantic plea for help. His voice, laden with panic and confusion, conveyed the turmoil of the moment. He told the operator, This guy is going to die on me. I don't know what to do. A statement that reflected both his fear and his unexpected concern for the man he had just beaten. The case quickly caught the attention of local law enforcement. Ultimately, the death of Flores in June led to a grand jury hearing, where the father's actions were scrutinized under the law. District Attorney Heather McMinn played a pivotal role in the proceedings, outlining the legal framework that would ultimately guide the jury's decision. Under Texas law, the use of deadly force is authorized and justified to stop an aggravated assault or sexual assault. This legal standpoint became the cornerstone of the father's defense. The grand jury, after hearing the evidence and the father's account, ruled that his actions were lawful. They decided not to indict him, effectively acknowledging the extremity of the circumstances and the father's instinctive response to protect his child. Forensic evidence further supported the father's account, confirming the sexual assault of the child by Flores. The community's response to this decision was largely supportive. Many locals empathized with the father, understanding his reaction to the traumatic event. Friends and neighbors expressed their solidarity, with some stating they would have done the same in his position. This sentiment was echoed by Mark Harabis, a friend of the family, and Sonny Jane, a local resident, who both felt that Flores received a deserving fate. Paramjeet Singh. In the quiet village of Jumba, Punjab, a father's profound anguish over his infant daughter's alleged rape led to a harrowing act of revenge. After his infant daughter's molester, a teenager by the name of Parminder Singh was presented in court. Paramjit Singh initially offered Parminder a ride to the Batinda courts, supposedly to formalize a compromise. However, this offer was a deceitful ploy. During the journey, Paramjit spiked Parminder's drink, incapacitating him. He then transported the unconscious teenager to a secluded area in Jumba. In this isolated spot, Paramjit's plan reached its grim conclusion. He tied Parminder to a tree 
and, with a sharp-edged weapon, executed his brutal form of justice by severing the young man's hands. Following the incident, Palmjit Singh was apprehended near the crime scene. During his preliminary interrogation, he revealed the premeditated nature of his actions, including carrying the rope and weapon used in the attack. The police, led by Superintendent Bikramjit Singh, charged Paramjit with an attempt to murder under Section 307 of the Indian Penal Code, IPC. Parminder Singh, grievously injured, was rushed to the Guru Gobind Singh Medical College and Hospital in Faridkot. Despite the severity of his injuries, his condition was reported as stable. However, he was left to live without his hands for the rest of his life. Katie Coleman Katie Coleman, a 10-year-old girl from Crothersville, Indiana, lived a normal, happy life with her family until January 25, 2005, when a routine trip to a nearby store turned into a nightmare. Her mother, Angela, sent her to pick up some items, expecting her to return in about half an hour. When Katie didn't come back, her parents, including her father, John Neese, began to worry. Despite their efforts and those of many volunteers, the police soon believed Katie had been abducted. Two days after her disappearance, a witness reported seeing Katie in a white pickup truck with a skinny white man. Tragically, on January 30th, Katie's body was found in Lake Sippers. Initially, Charles Hickman confessed to accidentally causing Katie's death when she stumbled upon him and an accomplice cooking meth. However, a medical examination revealed that Katie had been raped and the DNA evidence did not match Hickman or his accomplice. Three months later, detectives found a crucial piece of evidence, a cigarette butt near the lake that matched the DNA found on Katie. This led them to Anthony Stockelman, who sold the same brand of cigarettes. Stockelman's DNA matched the evidence, and he was arrested for Katie's murder and rape. Stockelman struck a deal with prosecutors, pleading guilty to avoid the death penalty, and was sentenced to life in prison without parole. His appeal, claiming extreme mental or emotional disturbance, was rejected. In a twist of fate, Stockelman ended up in the same prison as Katie's cousin, Jared Harris. In 2006, Harris forcibly tattooed, with a sharpener, Katie's revenge, on Stockelman's forehead, earning himself an additional seven years in prison. Stockelman was then placed in solitary confinement, where he remains to this day. Eduardo Gallo Eduardo Gallo's daughter, Paula, 25 at the time, was kidnapped from Tepoztlan, a place just 90 minutes south of Mexico City. But this was not just a singular event. It was indicative of a larger, more pervasive problem in Mexico at the time. Kidnappings were rampant, instilling fear and uncertainty among the populace. At first, the kidnappers, who had taken Paola from Eduardo's weekend home, remained elusive. Then, aware of the emotional leverage they held, they expected a substantial payment for Paola's release. But tragically, the outcome of this ordeal was the worst possible scenario for any parent. Despite the ransom paid, Paola was murdered by her kidnappers. This brutal end to a young life only fueled Eduardo's resolve to fight against the epidemic of kidnappings in Mexico. Refusing to let his daughter's case become just another forgotten statistic, Eduardo embarked on a mission to track down those responsible for Paola's kidnapping and murder. His breakthrough came when he located the public telephone that the suspected gunman had been using near his hideout to maintain communication with associates affiliated with the gang. Through a confidential method of call tracking, Gallo was led to a public telephone in Tultitlan, located approximately 10 miles to the north of the capital within the state of Mexico. He shared this discovery with the Morelos police, who, in collaboration with authorities from the state of Mexico, devised a plan on Sunday to encircle the nearby residences. With Gallo stationed at one of the observation points, law enforcement successfully apprehended Francisco Zamora Arellano, a 28-year-old individual hailing from the economically disadvantaged state of Guerrero, who had been residing in the town. Montiel reported that Zamora confessed to the shooting of Paola Gallo.